It's time for the Newsmaker Show on News Talk AM 1480 WLEA. Here's Kevin Torres. Well, yesterday we uh, interviewed two authors about the uh, former WLEA radio announcer Bob Crane. And our guest today is another former WLEA radio announcer. His name is Eric Griffith. Eric, thanks for joining us. So happy to be here. Eric is a 1988 Hornell High School graduate. He later graduated from Ithaca College. I believe that was 92. That's right. And he works for PC Magazine. And he's been on the show before. The last time he was on, he was talking about his book, Beta Test. Um, Eric, you write a lot for PC Magazine. And uh, I wanted to ask you about a few of your articles. One of them entitled... The Nine Awesome But Super Dangerous Toys. Tell us about that. Well, we we have the ability to do some fun little stories occasionally that are a little more about nostalgia than they are about technology. I tried to do a good mix of looking at toys from the last 60 years that have made it past the government watchdogs and still made it to shelves and still could have killed your children. Uh, like the top one is one that I owned as a kid, lawn darts. It put thousands of people in the hospital in the 1970s uh, and still was sold for a long time, even after everybody knew it was dangerous. Uh, I think you can still get versions of them today that are not quite as able to crack a skull open. Give us some more. Give us some more. You know, the, the one they, they talk about... Uh, a lot uh, the, the government sends out emails uh, the state government sends out emails on um, toys with poison in them um, and things that, that kids can uh, eat and swallow it would be damaging. Do you have anything like that? Oh yeah, plenty of those. Well, like for example, um, the Battlestar Galactica TV show that came out originally in the 1970s uh, it was a knockoff of Star Wars and of course Star Wars was famous for not getting toys out on time when the first movie came out, and so they kind of missed the first Christmas season in 1977. Battlestar the Galactica, they didn't want to make that mistake. They got their toys out almost immediately. Uh, the problem was is that one of the toys in particular would shoot a little missile out, pretending to be like a laser, and uh, killed at least one little boy in 1978. Uh-oh. And by 1979... All of those toys have been pulled off the shelves, and when they went back on sale, the little missile was glued inside instead of able to shoot out. Sure. Those kinds of things have been an ongoing problem for the government. You know, these days, we, there's, there's still chemicals that are problems. Like, uh, used to have uh, crime kits that they would sell kids when, when I was a kid, and you were a kid. Well... They did it again just a few years ago. In 2007, there was one based on the TV show CSI, which is really popular. They sold a fingerprint examination kit, but the thing was that uh, they had little particles of asbestos in the fingerprint powder. So little kids who were maybe spreading this stuff all over every doorknob in the house, who knows, uh, could have been spreading a little bits of uh, asbestos around the place, too. You know, you talk about uh, dangerous toys. What, in in your view, what was the worst, most recent dangerous toy? Um, probably the most dangerous recently. I'm going to say is Bucky balls. These were little magnetic uh, ball bearings. Essentially, they look like ball bearings. And they, they're great fun to play with. I've played with them before, and they, they had a, a big push within the last couple of years, or maybe about 2011. And they were uh, fun. They're fascinating. You build things out of them. The problem is they're very small, and they're really, really magnetic. So just swallowing two of those could cause all sorts of damage for your innards. And there were a lot of kids... That this happened to, um, there was one death of a 22-month-old that was reported. And, and the problem is Buckyballs wasn't the only one. There's been other companies, uh, the people who make Magnetics, which I think were the same folks that used to make the uh, Erector set back in the day. They had the magnets falling out of their bigger plastic toys, and they'd still get swallowed. 
So if you learn anything from toys, it's that uh, magnets and your stomach uh, do not mix. That's a bad combo. I guess not. We're talking with Eric Griffith, who's from Hornell. He's written numerous articles for PC Magazine. His most recent article is about Apple's new iOS 9. That's the new operating system. So let's say you don't have Apple, but, you know, you have a, uh, a PC and you use Windows. It would be like, you know, Windows 7, 8, whichever. Uh, if you listen to the Rush Limbaugh show, you heard Rush talk about this before, the new Apple thing. He's an Apple guy, and he's always excited when the new Apple product comes out. Eric, the first thing I noticed in your online article about the new Apple operating system is that people who use Siri, and I think even people who don't use Siri know what it is, uh, the people who use Siri will notice that Siri looks different. Anything you can tell us about that? The look is a little different on a lot of things in iOS 9. They changed the font slightly. Um, they're, they're very subtle things. Um, the biggest thing about Siri is that when you're talking to her and you can kind of see your voice pattern at the bottom of the screen so you can tell that the phone or the iPad that you're using is listening to you, uh, they change the waveform on Siri. So it is more of a rainbow color of waveform. So, you know, it's a, just a little update that makes you know you've got the, the latest greatest thing you know sound different is it the same voice uh you actually have uh a few different voice changes you you've always had a male and female um and i noticed uh and, and they, they might have had this before to be honest but i noticed playing with siri on the new operating system that they now have versions of the male and female with a uk uh english accent and also an australian accent so it's fun to have an australian person and ask them about shrimps on the barbie Eric, uh, this article about um, iOS 9, it also has an online slideshow, you know, which makes for easy reading. Eric writes for PCMag.com. Your online slideshow shows that with the new Apple iOS 9, you can take better video. I'm sure that would be of interest to people who uh, have Apple products. It is. Uh, every time there's a new uh, phone that comes out from Apple, and they do it once a year where they'll have a couple new models, they always upgrade the camera inside the phone. Uh, the technology stays the same size but gets better and better, which is a fantastic boon for everybody. Uh, with the new iPhone 6S and the 6S Plus, which just became available for sale on Friday of last week, the camera inside now for still pictures is a 12-megapixel camera. And the previous version from last year was only an 8-megapixel camera. So, I mean, that's a pretty substantial update. Uh, megapixels aren't as important as the size of a sensor inside of a camera, but in this case it still gives you a pretty good indication of a, of a quality jump. When it comes to video, the great thing is, is that now with that new phone, and again, you, the operating system update won't help you if you've got an older iPhone, but if you get the new phones and you have this camera, you will be able to take video quality at what we call 4K, and 4K is the best video quality we currently have available in the United States, probably in the world, for commercial use. So, for example, you could actually buy a television set that would support 4K. The problem is, is that not even Blu-ray video uh, on a disc is actually 4K. It's not a high enough resolution. It'll still look great on your 4K television, but the ability to play 4K is limited because the sources of 4K video are so limited. And having it available on an iPhone with people walking all over the place taking video with it, it's going to make that kind of technology explode. And the photos are also better. They also come out at a higher resolution. Yeah, the, that 12 megapixel number means you're going to get uh, you know, th a, a third better size of a picture. They also did something very unique with iOS 9, and again, only available in the new iPhone 6S and 6S Plus, is something they're calling live photos. So every time you take a picture now, a still picture, with the new iPhone, the phone will actually take a little snippet of video on either side of the picture. So when you go back through and look at your pictures, your still pictures, 
if you just hold your finger down on that new phone, because they have some new technology built into the screen on the phone, you'll get back like a three-second video, uh, kind of like what an animated GIF file looks like online, where it kind of loops for you. Uh, but this one has sound, and you get a little bit more of a really unique presentation to the pictures that you've been taking, uh, a little bit more of the memory you know, rather than getting the same picture of your dog's face over and over again, you might be able to catch it in the middle of a yawn or some fun little thing with your kids that you didn't see in the still, but you can see in the video that you didn't even know you were taking. We're talking with Eric Griffith, PC Magazine. He's a Hornell guy and uh, interesting articles, 25 apps for the tech-savvy teachers. That was one of your articles. Tell us about that. Yeah, I, every year we try to do the best we can to cover the back-to-school marketplace and everything that's happening, you know, from July and August and into September when uh, the kids and the teachers are all going back to school, whether they love it or dread it. You know, everybody needs to know about the latest, greatest things. And, you know, I've been lucky that uh, the last couple of years I've been able to write up uh, a few things that are really handy for teachers. There's things... Um, like uh, there's a thing called EduBlogs, it's E-D-U Blogs. It's a blogging platform that's built specifically for teachers so that they can use it to post things online and then get the word out to students, parents, uh, other teachers, whoever, um, without it becoming a big public thing like, say, a WordPress blog. You know, with, That way they can make sure that they get just their target audience of, of, of students and, and parents. Talking with Eric Griffith. Eric, you also have an article on PCMag.com about the fastest ISPs. It's uh, Internet Speed Connections. So who's the fastest? Who came out on top? Well, it depends on where you are. If we're going to talk about the fastest ever in the United States right now, you're really lucky if you live in... Wisconsin and the Dakotas, because there is an ISP there that, based on our data, we always have seen in the last couple of years, I shouldn't say always, but the last couple of years we have seen is the fastest. They have blazingly fast speeds on average. And, and again, this data is all based on information that we get from a, a company that uh, our parent company owns. Their name is Ookla. They put out speedtest.net, and probably anybody who has ever called their ISP for help has probably been told, go over to speedtest.net and run this test, and let's see how fast your connection really is. So because our parent company also owns Ookla, we're able to get this data, we crunch the numbers, but we also run it through the filter of trying to have PC Mag readers give us their specifics. So in this case, uh, Mid-Continent Communications uh, in the Dakotas and Wisconsin area, they come out the fastest. They get a, a really high speed, almost double that of anybody else. Now, locally, the probably the closest you could get, and again, it's going to depend on where you live, if it's even available to you, is Verizon Fios. Fios has been pretty much the leader of the nationwide ISPs every time we've done this story since 2010. And spell that for us. Is it F-I-O-S? F-I-O-S, that's correct. And, and the reason they're the fastest is they do fiber to the home. They do fiber optic cable. They run it down the poles. They bring it directly to your house. And fiber optics are infinitely going to be faster than your cable or especially the copper lines that come into your house, which end up being a D, what's called a DSL connection, a digital subscriber line connection. So if you can get fiber to the home, then you probably want it. And I know that in the Hornell area, for example, there is a fiber to the home provider named Empire. And my parents, for example, just got that connection and they've done speed tests and the reports are phenomenally better than anything that they ever had with Time Warner Cable. So I'm very jealous that Hornell actually gets fiber to the home before I'm able to even try it. <laughs> so Orne Hornell tops Ithaca on that one, Eric. Yes. Oh, it, it, it kicks our butts. It really does. And you know, and being in a college town, I kind of thought we'd we'd be getting the lead on that. But no, Hornell definitely took the took the gold. 
Speaking of college, I see you have an article about do college students prefer digital textbooks, ones, ones that they can read on their uh, phone or mobile device or computer, or good old-fashioned paper versions? What's the answer to that? Well, it, it depends on what study you're looking at. I've seen a couple of now where they're, they're saying that while kids prefer the digital because it's convenient and they can take it with them anywhere, it turns out that actually studying with a paper book, something that you can write on and scribble in and so forth, make notes in the margin, whatever, helps them to retain their information better. So it's kind of a six of one, half dozen of another. It just depends on how they're going to study. Another big factor, though, is textbooks. Uh, you want to be able to return them. They're really expensive, whether they're digital or on paper. Uh, even the digital ones can cost somewhere between 250 to $400 per book, which seems crazy to most people who would use it digitally because there's no paper or printing or shipping involved. But, you know, the publishers want to get their money. So one of the keys is to look for a provider, and I have a listing of them in that story that I wrote, uh, that will let you do not only returns of your print textbook, but will actually let you return your digital textbook, or at least get some money back for it at the end of the semester. Talking with Eric Griffith of uh, PC Magazine, and we'll be back in just a moment here on the Newsmaker Show. Stay with us. It's Brian O'Neill filling in for Kevin Doran on the Newsmaker Show, and we're talking with Eric Griffith. As we've said a couple times, he's a Hornell native, now lives in Ithaca, writes for PC Mag. Dot com that's PC or personal computer magazine great thing about Eric's writing is you know if you're a little bit older or if you're just not naturally a techie type he breaks it down and makes it really easy uh, to understand even the lowest common denominators like uh, yours truly can figure out what he's saying so it, do it doesn't go over your head I see you have an interesting article here about will uh, things go paperless it says, quote, the world talks a good game when it says paperless is the way to go, but printers are here to stay, especially in the work environment. Eric Griffith, tell us about that. Well, we do a, 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 a lot of work looking at the various kinds of technology that are out there. Printers uh, are one that we have done surveys on, for example, for years and years and years. We try to keep track of who our PC Mag readers think are the very best providers of printers, and we do it for other things as well, desktops, uh, tablets, phones, etc. Printers, for example, usually one of the top players tends to be Brother uh, International. They make fantastic printers. I have one myself. Uh, they do a really good job of not only making a quality product, they make a quality product that they back up with really excellent service. And for a lot of people, uh, doesn't matter what the age, older, younger, whatever, when you run into that problem with your hardware, you need to have somebody you can call and count on. So part of our surveys, uh, we, we traditionally call them the service and reliability surveys. In that case, we wanted to know for businesses or individuals, and it turns out Brother is the tops in both, if you make a call to them, are you going to get satisfaction? Are you going to get the help you need? And it turns out Brother gets the highest marks usually across the board. Eric, wanted to uh, ask you about Facebook. And I, I, I know I, I don't see you've written any articles about Facebook, but the topic of Facebook comes up a lot. Uh, one reason is is that, as you know, Wellsville native who disappeared, Paul Seglia, uh, filed a lawsuit against Facebook claiming that Mark Zuckerberg promised him quite a bit of that, 85%, I think, was the original amount. Uh, Seglia disappeared in March of this year. Nobody's seen him since, at least nobody who's talking, the federal officials looking all over for him. I'm uh, wondering about Facebook, Twitter, the social media websites. Do, do you have any insights on those? What, you know, what's the most popular? Which ones do you say, see staying around for the time being? Well, uh, I don't think anybody would dare bet against Facebook anymore. They have come, you know, they've only been around since 2007, which is hard to believe, and yet have become almost 
uh, so big that there are, there's a huge contingent of people who think that the Internet is Facebook. It reminds me sometimes of the 1990s when the Internet was really taking off and most people were using AOL or America Online, as they used to call it, and really thought that that was the Internet. AOL definitely was not. It was what right. I tend to call an, an online service that just happened to take advantage of being uh, a part of the Internet, but it certainly wasn't the whole thing. So Facebook has managed to do the same thing, you know, 15 years later and become a household name. I am certainly a, I, I don't know if I would call myself a Facebook fan, but I am certainly a Facebook user, sometimes egregiously, and I have had friends who have left the service entirely, and I find that when they're not on Facebook, it's incredibly annoying because when I want to share things with them or tell them things, I have to go to a whole other service to try to get in touch with them. Whereas when the vast majority of people are on Facebook, it makes the sharing and communication a lot easier. That said, is it like a real personalized, uh, excellent form of communication? Uh, probably not as good. You're not putting as much thought into it. It's not like writing a letter to your sweetheart or your grandma or whatever it used to be 20 years ago when uh, you could really tangibly tell that you put the effort in. Uh, these things are quite easily forgotten. They're very ephemeral, um, more so even with something like Twitter, for example, which is extremely limited because you can only use a certain number of characters every time you put out something. But that said, uh, Twitter is is kind of a force in and of itself. You have tons of celebrities on there. You have news outlets who turn to Twitter first when something big happens in the news and they need comment from a wide variety of people. They will turn immediately to Twitter to be able to get that. And that's, that's a pretty astounding thing. But that said, uh, there are other services that are all about sharing, like Instagram, uh, which is owned by Facebook and is really primarily for sharing pictures. But Instagram, for example, just surpassed Twitter in the sheer number of users that it has. So maybe Twitter is on the downswing. Uh, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't discount any of them until they've filed Chapter 11 and closed their doors. What do you think of Zuckerberg? You know, a lot of people will say, for example, that... Zuckerberg stole this, that, or the other thing, or that Facebook isn't what it used to be. A lot of younger people's are, you know, a lot of younger people are using this, that, or the other social website. What are your thoughts on Zuckerberg? Well, personally, uh, I'm not sure I would call him a genius, uh, but I think he was a is a forceful personality who made the right piece of software at the very uh, perfect time. Uh, a perfect marketer, um, you know, he, he knows how to do a lot of things. He's certainly made mistakes, but he is working in a medium that lets him make those mistakes and then kind of turn it around and give up on them, and it, it, it's not a huge loss or problem for his company. You know, he's, he's also becoming, uh, as he gets older, and when I say older, I think he's finally in his 30s, he uh, has become quite the, uh, the philanthropist has donated hundreds of millions of dollars to things uh, in a way that is, makes him really second only to Bill Gates, uh, another guy who got rich off technology. So, I mean, the good thing is is that most of these shark-like personalities who run these companies tend to also have a conscience, even if it's in, you know, their later days. You know, uh, the kind of thing that uh, having a conscience doesn't usually help a CEO get a business uh, to the successful levels, unfortunately. If only that were true. But you think they developed them later on. Eric Griffith, always great having you on. We should have you on more often. A very interesting show today. Uh, any final thoughts? Hey, always happy to uh, be on the show. I'd love to also uh, thank you for the kind words you said about my writing for, uh, for older people. In fact, uh, because of that, uh, if folks in the audience uh, get the AARP magazine, uh, I will have some articles actually in that, in the December issue. So I'm looking forward to seeing that come out. Eric Griffith, that's very interesting. He's got an article coming out in AARP Magazine uh, later this year, and he's got uh, a lot of articles that are very useful to read and easy to read. Like I said, if you're not a techie, 
uh, the, you know, you can figure out exactly what he's saying. If you are a techie, you learn some uh, very interesting things quickly. Eric, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. And ABC is next on AM 1480, WLEA Hornell.